Uh, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Freedom of speech is, is a really important issue, not just because it's about speech, not just because it's about freedom, but just because the freedom of speech is logically prior to all of our other freedoms. There's no point in having freedoms on paper. There's no point in having so-called freedom of movement unless we also have freedom of speech. It's through our capacity to express ourselves, to communicate our ideas without any fear, without any inhibitions. It's only through that culture of freedom that all the other freedoms really fit into place. And that's something that is non-negotiable. One of the things that really concerns me is that over the last 20 or 30 years in Western societies, there's been a very profound sense of cultural cowardice, a sense of cultural inhibition, which basically means that the freedom of speech is not taken seriously. It's taken seriously rhetorically. But actually, when you talk to people, uh, you find that it's not something that raises their passion. It's not something they will want to go to war about. It's not something that they will stand up and fight on. And in fact, in my area, in academia, I, I'm often struck by the fact that people spend more time and devote far more energy in trying to curb our right to express ourselves than to expand it. And it seems to me that in a civilized world, in a truly democratic world, what we should be doing is working at how we create even more space for freedom rather than to find an excuse as to why you cannot say this word or why that word offends somebody else. And that seems to be the real problem. You see, uh, many of you will have been interested and involved in the political sphere, the, the laws that pertain on, on these matters, which are really, really quite important. But I take the view that what happens in Parliament, what happens in law, is underpinned by some very powerful forces which need to be confronted in the first instance. And they're cultural forces. It's really about the cultural attitudes towards what we think about speech, about freedom. It's really ultimately cultural attitudes about what we think about ourselves as human beings, about our capacity to communicate, our capacity to deal with offense, our capacity to deal with criticism. All those things are really quite critical. I think there are two things that I just want to draw to your attention that i like to, con to consider. Uh, over the last week, I had two experiences which really brought home to me just how deep-seated the problem is. The first experience was I got a phone call in England uh, from the BBC saying, uh, Frank, can you uh, comment on a development that has occurred with, with Tom and Jerry? At first, I thought they were taking the piss, you know, sort of. <laughs> Tom and Jerry is not something I usually kind of comment upon. Until I discovered that Amazon, which I think exists in Australia as well, has decided to put a warning on Tom and Jerry cartoons saying that, uh, be warned, Tom and Jerry uh, uh, cartoons show uh, sort of values and attitudes that are unacceptable today. They're a little bit racist, you know, sort of. Now, I don't know about you and me, but you know, having watched and having grown up on Tom and Jerry, I never thought they were you know, sort of uh, that excessive or racist, but apparently it is. So I, I, I kind of thought, it, thought about it, and then I realized that actually we live in a world where censorship is not simply targeting you and I on our everyday life, but it's going backwards in history. It's almost like there's an imperative, there's an impulse to censor the voices of the early 20th century, the 19th century, almost like kind of flatten out the difference between the present and the past. And I don't know if you recall Orwell's writings on the subject, but he talked about the memory hole, and he talked about the way in which there's an impulse towards uh, almost uh, redefining the values of the past to be consistent with what we're doing today. And he was like kind of, you, you would have thought, well, he's just really exaggerating a little bit, memory hole. But when you find that this has become a very commonplace development today, you know you're in trouble. The same day that I got that phone call, I discovered that in the Barbican Center, which is one of the biggest art centers in London, uh, a play had been canceled because protesters outside said it was racist. It was actually an anti-racist play by committed anti-racist kind of campaigners. But because it showed a black person in a cage, the argument was this was demeaning, racially offensive, and the play was canceled. And that was bad enough. 
What was even worse, because I, I, I can handle the place being cancelled, that's nothing new. What was even worse was there was not even a murmur of protest from the art establishment. You would have thought that this would be like, you know, headline news, play censored, you know, sort of art being curbed. But what you had instead was this very um, embarrassed shuffling of the feet, people looking at their shoelaces, you know, hoping that nobody would pick up on it. And when you think about the fact that a play can get censored just like this, just because a few people say they're offended by it, then how long before television programs, books, and everything else just get very quietly sent, it's kind of quiet, soft kind of censorship. Now, these two things bring home to me two important developments that maybe we can discuss sometime. The first development, uh, which I think is really crucial here, is that all this stuff about freedom of speech assumes that you and I are kids, children. You know, we cannot help offense. The, the assumption is, is that if I hear something that's insulting, I'm going to pee my pants, and that's going to be the, the end of my life, so to speak. In other words, there's an assumption that uh, human beings haven't got the moral autonomy, the independence, to deal with difficult you know, kind of issues. And of course, if that's what we think of ourselves, then we are creating a world where the idea of vulnerability, the idea of, of just being uh, sort of weak subjects, means nothing else than an invitation to the state to come in and hold our hands. You know, I, there's a word we use in English now, it's a new word. When I was a kid, the word was never used, we're here to support you. It's an interesting word. When I, when I came to England and, and, and learned English, nobody was there to support me, you know, unless you were like a, you know, so fragile that you had to be held. Now everybody's being supported. And the person that's supporting you is not a person, it's actually the state. And the more we define ourselves downward as these infants and vulnerable, the more that becomes an invitation uh, for an institution to come in and be very ever so helpful in ultimately protecting ourselves from ourselves. I and mean, that's really what they're saying. That we need, we need the state to do that. The second thing that's linked to it, and this is where I think some of the stuff the IPA is doing is really quite important, is that it leads to this new imperative which is what I call the imperative of juridification, where literally everything you touch is turned into law. You know, when you look at the proliferation of legal instruments in Western societies, the way that literally everything becomes micromanaged, where it's not even just, even just the speech that gets censored, but we even have uh, sort of speech codes. Many institutions have rules about the words you can say and you cannot use in my university. There are words I cannot use without, you know, sort of, without violating the speech code of my universities. When you think of the way in which even interpersonal relationships at offices are now codified by rules, both formal law and also quasi-law. And one of the horrific things that's occurring is that this process of juridification, the making of new laws, has got no end to it. It's, you, you think, well, they, they passed enough rules about bullying at work, and just when you thought they couldn't have any more laws, somebody comes, hey, we, we didn't think of this, and another uh, sort of law is passed. And, and just when you think that every single word in English language that's mildly offensive has been censored, they then say, well, you know, this word, I mean, you know, I remember writing the word brainwashed in one of my books, and my editor saying, Frank, brainwashed is unacceptable. <laughs> And I said, I, again, I thought he was taking the piss, you know, kind of having a laugh. But then I realized that by using the word brainwashed, using the word brainwashed, I was offending epileptic people. And I can give you loads and loads of examples of words that you probably haven't even thought about as being injurious, who are also being censored. So the point that I'm making is that unless we stand up and fight, unless we kind of give a bit of courage to ourselves and not allow, not, not, not look the other way, when these new laws come in, but denounce it and argue against it, make fun of it, unless we do that, we really haven't seen the end of the process. We're in the, we're in the middle of a, of a dark age where this kind of moral and cultural cowardice actually allows uh, sort of the censorious attempts to rule and regulate our intimate life, our personal life, goes pretty much unchecked. And that's why what you're doing in this organization is so important. Thank you. Thank you.